So let's talk soccer. And you know that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. So for you guys, I'll let Sean kind of give a little bit of a backstory on his credibility, I guess, to talk about this stuff. So I had the opportunity uh, over a, a number of years to work with a professional organization as their youth scout, um, as you know, one of them, and and to start building you know some of the youth programs. I also had the opportunity to work and and be a part of some. Uh, international, um, just kind of little blips on the radar as well, uh, overseas, and, and even have some consulting stuff that I'm still doing now, you know, as, as we speak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's something that we can, you know, maybe let you know about soon. Um, but hopefully it's uh, uh, soccer or, or, you know, football around the world is, is a sport that I didn't grow up, you know, playing or, or being super close to, but just kind of through my experiences in life and, and where I've had the chance to go and, and live have, it's grown to be the number one sport in my heart. And, and, right. and I love the beautiful game and love the uh, chances that I had to scout youth and, and see youth that are working to perfect their craft and just kind of expressing joy out on the field. And, and, and man, it was, it was awesome. And still love it to this day. Stopping off and watching games, the wife will be like, uh, "Who are you going to watch?" <laughs> and I'll be like, "Ah, oh, you don't know him." He's like, "Why are you going to watch him?" You know, because I love it. Because I enjoy it. Because I can. <laughs> it's what I do. So, so it's. Uh, I really enjoy the the level of intellect um, and kind of the playing chess as opposed to some sports kind of are a little bit more like playing checkers, right? Mm -hmm. in, in my mind, and and I love the intelligence of the sport, um, and and it's a joy to talk about it. And, and we just kind of went through a, a World Cup year, right? Right. And, and we watched some of the World Cup together matches. What do, you, what do you remember about this last World Cup? What stood out to you? Man, I feel like that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was late last year. It was a, the Winter World Cup, right? Right. It was in Qatar. Right. A big thing, I mean, for me, I focus mainly on the U.S. Um, that's what... I've enjoyed watching the most, obviously, but we kind of we kind of talked about it before. We we knew that team wasn't wasn't ready yet, but was excited to see what kind of some of our young guys could Loved do. Loved the youth, right? Yeah. Super young team, I, and and that's a big thing. Is there were some younger players that impressed that I didn't expect to come out and play as well. I I I've, I've been blown away, and even till now with uh, Wea and the way that dude's developed, and I'm hoping hoping we can get as we start preparing um and playing friendlies and stuff right now we can get the right players on the field and not waste this time for american soccer um because i as, as a u.s soccer fan this is one of the best times to be a u.s soccer fan because of how many young really good players are playing around the world right now we are in the pool of U.S. talent, it's it's getting deeper than than we've ever had it. Now, that doesn't really solve all the issues, and we still have Greg Berhalter as a coach. And I, I'm not a huge fan of the Berhalter situation, nor his brother, nor the hiring situations that brought him on. Which, if if you want us to go into that, you know, comment, let us know. We'll we'll talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, there's 100%. there's a lot of conflict of interest things. That have gone on for a long time with our, our U.S. national program and and kind of the powers that be. Um, but the the World Cup to me was was fantastic to see Argentina's run. That's one true. of the best finals in That's the true. history of the game. It, it, it was great to see Messi finally get his his World Cup, you know, and trophy and and, and get through that. The the uh, all the Argentine fans that were saying that he wasn't as good as Maradona because he hadn't won a World Cup yet, which though that's the standard you're at when you're in Argentina. Yeah, <laughs> but, for sure. But, I mean, Messi, uh, to me, you know, one of the top, you know, two, three greatest of all time, you know, he could easily be number one, fantastic player. Um, and that was really awesome to see, the emotions to see uh, Argentina's next friendly that they had in, in the the fans' reception and the fireworks and everything yeah, was awesome. Yeah, that was cool. That was really it cool was incredible. And, and the respect that he got, so fantastic. And they beat a great French team in the final and how that all went down. 
um, that was really enjoyable. Uh, the U.S. had spurts where where we looked pretty good and aggressive. It seems like we kind of overran ourselves, and in the second half of each game, we kind of really struggled. Uh, you know, there's some some players that were left off of the team that were mind boggling. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that, that was unbelievable. They just don't make sense. Yeah. The the forwards that we took and, and we still left off Ricardo Pepe is is mind boggling to me just because his hold up play is is really valuable in in a, a forum like that um, was was pretty questionable um, but overall you know love the World Cup time of year just the, the level of competition we ended up going out against Netherlands and one of the quotes from the the Dutch coach was just kind of laughing that we didn't ever make an adjustment in the game from the way that they pressed us. Right. And which they just put their they just put their forwards in between our center backs and our outside backs, which was our main channel of passing, and instead beat simple pressure up through the middle. And we couldn't we can't. That and that's and that's the thing is as these couple friendlies have happened, we're running into the same problems. Now tonight the we just got, just got done watching the US play Ghana and we put it on them. That right. that was the combinations of Balogun playing in, at the forward spot with Timothy Way at the right wing and Sergino Desk going up the right side. Um, and Claudio Reyna's son, Gio, and how he creates... Maybe we shouldn't bring up his parents. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't bring up his parents. But the way that he creates... So, so we have a real problem in our U.S. soccer culture with having a real midfielder's culture. Um, we have tried to fix that by putting out runners. Right. And, and Tyler Adams is a physical specimen with what he's able to do. Right. With how physical he is and how much he runs and how much he does out there, it's, it's amazing. And, and I'm fine with having somebody like that out there, but I just really struggle when we try to play McKinney in, in there beside him. That's the, whole, and that's, that's the big problem is, is having one of them you know, either one is, is is fine. It's it's needed, <clears throat> but when you put both of them in the middle together, it it just there's no technical ability at that point in the midfield. At not all. at not at the World Cup level, right? The the MMA thing does not work, and and I would say that Kellen Acosta is kind of along the same lines. And these are all fantastic players. Don't get me wrong. Right. I, I'm just saying that at the world's top stage, <clears throat> we cannot have runners as midfielders you know it's 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 a situation where you're playing chess against the top midfielders around the world and they will all run and work hard you know yeah it's true that tony cruz isn't going to log as many miles as tyler adams it's just not going to happen but but his level of positioning and reading the game and seeing three passes ahead and understanding the why and and how to put it there just puts it at another level and, and we don't create enough space in passing lanes now, one thing that this group has really done is a lot of the, the quick showing to the ball layoff, um, you know, the wall passes in, in short spaces that we're, we're kind of pulling off that are very nice. But, but when we get up against the top organized pressing defenses, um, like this is kind of why Japan really exposed us when we played them in the, in the friendly. Right. And they, they handled us. It was 2-0, but they handled us. Right. It's because they have an organized press and they're smart about it, so our little layoffs and our one-twos and everything don't always work, and we can't play the tactical ball of playing out of pressure smart and quick switches of the ball fast enough to get the defensive moving to create the holes and the gaps. That's basically what it comes down to. But um, this week we've had some friendlies that, that are always fun. Um, Greg Berhalter is brought back in as coach, so we're going to ride this one out. Um, but I do like a lot of our young players. You know, Polisic has shown that he's explosive, well, and that's and that's the big thing about these young players is, for a couple of years we were just Pulisic was Captain America and the and the savior of U.S. soccer, but he's not a he's not Messi, right? He's not someone who's just going to go right. and and be this superhero. He needs when we get him the ball at midfield facing towards his own goal. It's he's not he's not going to get. It's not going to result in in goals. We have to be able to be technical enough and sophisticated enough to get him the ball 
running downhill towards the goal in the final third already. Yep. 100%. When we get that, he will be dangerous, and, and he can play on a world level and is a fantastic player. Um, you know, he'll be 28 this next World Cup, which is going to be in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. You know, most of the games in the U.S. Yeah. And and what a great opportunity for the U.S. team. And man, if if we can if we can get kind of Burhalter and Gio Reyna over some of their past of what happened after the the World Cup and kind of during what during and after during and after, right? Yeah, it's yeah. For those of you that don't know, it was you know Burhalter kind of was letting him know that he wasn't going to play in any games, you know, worth any note. And and Gio kind of started to get ticked and wasn't playing well. Some of his teammates even called him out. You know, he apologized, came back out, said it's okay, we'll leave it as a team. And then and afterwards, the coach basically after the World Cup talked to people about it openly and it was reported back and it was kind of a big kerfuffle. And then right. and then Gio Reyna's parents got involved and threw out some dirt because they're friends with Berhalter from back in the past. Anyways, and it got ugly that way. So um I would love to see if I if I were to say right now, I would be fine with a Tyler Adams, Eunice Musa at the eight and let Gio Reyna create at that ten. I would agree. Keep Pulisic out on the left wing. Uh, Balogun gives us our best forward right now as far as showing and then also combining and running into space. Whereas like Pepe and Sargent, they're really good hold-up players. Yeah. And, and they're a little bit bigger and, and more physical maybe for set pieces. But Balogun and, and his one finish tonight was he kind of the ball comes across the six. He does a little body feint, touches it around, and then just top corner. It was, it, it's, his, some of his finishes are really nice. And it, so for out, out of this group, he gives us the best chance. Um, Timothy Way on the right side. And then Chris Richards and, and – uh, Miles Robinson seemed to be our, our future, the center backs in the back. But they, they, looked, they looked really strong tonight. Got to give that to them. Yeah. Offensively creative. And, and that, was, that was a Ghana team that was playing their players. They had Thomas Partey. They had Jordan Ayew. Uh, Mohamed Kudus was out there. Uh, it's, and, and some talented players. But we shredded them, especially up that right channel. It, it was fun to watch. That's my big thing I'm really excited about going forward with U.S. soccer is – this front unit that we are able to kind of throw out there and create with, if we put the right guys like Gio Reyna in the midfield, um, gives them the great opportunities. But I mean, it's it's shown that where we can take advantage going up the right like that, Pulisic is very good flying into the middle. So it puts not only are we getting it down the field in the right players, you know, with the right people we also are getting Pulisic in the best situation. So it seems this front is not just good for Pulisic. It's good for the future of our team. It's good for development. And so that's been really cool to watch ever since kind of Wea and Des stepped into their roles. Um, I'm excited to see what happens over the next season or two with um, Pulisic at um, AC Milan. Mm -hmm. I think that change has been really good for him. Um, getting some consistent minutes starting most of the time is going to be really important for his trajectory to be where we need him to be. Um, some of the other guys will kind of see what happens as they mature into their primes and things like that. Indeed. And the, the amount of, of kids that are moving over to Europe and playing now is, is the highest that it's ever been. Which is you know, a good thing. It's, it's a good thing. It's it's a very good thing. Um, you know, you could you could easily make the argument that with the amount of kids that we have flowing into our academy structures and in and, and through the club ball here, that we should accidentally be producing more players that are approaching the world class level. I I would dare say we we haven't US has never had a world class player. Right. Yet we've had some players that have gone through amazing barriers and done some things against the odds, but we should have more just by the numbers. I mean, I mean, we have. There are some countries out there that have a population that is one fifth of the amount of registered youth soccer players we have in this country that have multiple Ballon d'Or winners. Right. And and so there's there's something, that, and that's not just because it's the top sport over there. 
You know, this is an argument we run into. The, the typical American arguments of, well, soccer isn't big here just because it isn't the top sport. Well, that's weird because Germany and has produced an NBA MVP. We've had tons of Hall of Famers out of all different countries through Europe. Yep. The last five MVPs of the NBA were born outside of the U.S. Right. And so, and these are out of countries where basketball is not the top sport. And that, this, this excuse doesn't fly. And that's people. the problem is that the, the excuse, the argument everyone wants to make is if we put guys like LeBron James on the field, we would make, you know, we would be incredible. And yeah. it, that's not the point. And that's, that's not going to do anything for us. It, that, that's going to make us worse. When, when somebody says that, you know, immediately that they, they're not really in tune with what development looks like and, and what that, is. despite LeBron being a fantastic athlete right. in soccer, he would not be a top athlete with having the the foot control and be able to keep it under there. Maybe may have been a great goalie <laughs> if he would have trained at that since he was a youngster. Right? Maybe that's funny because another uh, another academy coach and I one time were at lunch and we were with another fellow that we worked with and that also worked for a professional organization. Turned and said, "Can you imagine if LeBron James played soccer?" And, and the other two of us just kind of looked at each other and just like, <laughs> "Wow, can't believe we're hearing this." But that's yeah. kind of some of the stuff you hear in the u.s but i don't want to you know kind of don't want to be a, a super you know debbie down around at all because there are some exciting times with the amount of youth we have in there we're still not to a level where we're really can play with the big boys of the world we're still not um you know tonight uruguay beat brazil and it was for the first time in 22 years i want to say it was in brazil i have to I'll double check i might be off on that but but Think about Uruguay and what they do. What's what's their population for their country? I think it's like five million. Yeah, it's that's not much. Right. It's like half the size of New Jersey. And and they, they do stuff like that. So we have to get to the point of, yes, celebrating our victories and, and having fun with what our national team does and in and some of their failures too and, and living through that, but but being willing to take the steps and, and admit and push for a better way of developing our youth and, and understanding there's there's a higher intelligent way to to develop youth and, and get them ready for our, our national team. And, and I think that eventually once our national team becomes a winner, that it will then be celebrated in a way that, you know, some kids in, in, in the inner city, instead of, you know, shooting hoops, they're over there, they're, they're kicking around a ball. And right. all of a sudden that culture will start to steamroll. And once we have a culture like that and an identity that comes along, that's when it would become special. That's the right. gravy on top. So, but it, it, love these times of years when all the friendlies are happening and, and all the games this week and sometimes yelling at my TV and disgust and other times happy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just excited to see kind of what the future next few years holds for U.S. soccer and just kind of what, what can come, come from it. it it's a good, it, like I said, it's a good time to be, a U.S. soccer fan, so you know if you if you've been wanting to maybe get into it or anything like that, now's now's a pretty good time. This buildup is special to the summer of 2026 for the yep. next World Cup. It's in the U.S. It will be a fantastic event, and and we should have we should have one of the better results that we've ever had out of the U.S. national team, not counting 1930, right when there were. Like eight teams total in it. Right. Here's, here's the hoping for that. <laughs> so it, it should be it should be special. You know, it's for people. Most of the time, we've done enough to get out of group play in World Cup, and then sometimes we've won the next game after that. Sometimes I think like one time, um, and that was the 2002 year when with the group when he ended up going out to Germany in the round of 16. But most of the times we usually lose that first game right out of, of group play, and so understand that 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 is the standard that that we should be able to beat in 2026 and just getting out of group play is not good enough and we need to start holding the organization and the coaches responsible for why aren't we getting these results yeah 100 percent. the amount of money and the amount of kids and athletes and people flowing through our organizations it, it has to be better so that's what i'm about anyways we'll talk about this stuff through through the year Something I love. Yeah, as things progress, for sure.